All right, welcome, Jonathan Ross, founder and CEO of Grok, G-R-O-Q. I'm very excited to talk to you today. Uh, I interviewed two of your amazing engineers, Andrew Lang, Igor Arsovsky, uh, VP of Compiler Software and Chief Architect and Fellow, but now we get to talk to the man himself, Jonathan Ross. Thank you, welcome. Very happy for you to be here. Hello, thanks for having me. Uh, great to be on your show. So I have a handful of questions. Some of them span technical, some of them go into the business side. So really excited to hear your take on some of them. But first, coming from a founder myself, I want to know a little bit about the founding story of Grok. Previously, you were uh, at Google. You basically invented the TPU, the Tensor Processing Unit at Google, which is their custom silicon running a lot of their software. Why did you decide to leave? What did you think that you could do outside of Google that you couldn't do inside of Google? And how was that decision uh, come to? Well, I love my time at Google. It was amazing. And uh, got to build the, the Google TPU, which was the chip that powers all the AI there and learned a lot. And then I was in Google X and the Rapid Eval team, which is the team that comes up with the next things to do. And I, I kept referring to the, the TPU effort as a startup within Google. And I didn't quite realize at the time how, how constraining it is to be in a large company. And this is relevant right now and today because so many people are wondering whether or not they should go and start their own startups. And it, it's hard to make that decision. Well, the, the thing that really cinched it for me was when I realized in order for me to do something inside, it, it, was, it was sort of like VC. I had to get someone to fund it. But inside, I had to get a whole bunch of people to say yes, and it was an and across all of them. Whereas leaving, it was an or, and there were more people. There were thousands of VCs, and any one of them could fund it. So I could be more ambitious, I could be more bold than trying to fit in sort of the eye of the, the corporate needle. So if you're thinking about whether or not you want to start something yourself, the question is, do you feel constrained? And if you do, you're probably better off going and doing your own startup. Did you have the idea for the Grok architecture at Google and you couldn't get the green light and that's why you decided to leave or was there some other reason? No, actually, in fact, I didn't even know I was going to do a chip when I was leaving because I'd been doing so many other things. Um, and uh, for a while, I actually set a record for the, the best image classification model. Um, so I was doing machine learning, but I was also doing like bio. I was doing uh, mechanical engineering, all sorts of other things. Around the time that I left, what happened was the TPU paper got published and all the VCs wanted to talk about was an AI chip. And one of them asked me, what would you do differently? And I'm like, well, I'd make the software much easier to use because it was almost impossible. He's like, I'll fund that. And I'm like, okay. And so that was about it. And so we spent about, I would say, uh, the first six months working on just the, the compiler before we ever started designing the chip. And that's what gave us a very unique advantage. Okay, let's let's continue talking about the chip now. Grok is known for the inference speed. I mean, it's insane. We're talking five, six, seven plus hundred tokens per second. And I've read that the Grok chips themselves, while incredibly fast, have kind of a low memory per chip, which means it requires you to, if you're a business and you're acquiring a, a, you know, Grok hardware to run your own inference, you have to buy a bunch of them and they're not inexpensive. So how, how should companies think about that? And what was the decision to make the memory lower? Why, why was that decision made? And then, yeah, how, how should businesses thinking about running their own inference on their own hardware think about buying Grok hardware? That's a great question. And you can't build something different without doing some things that are a little bit counterintuitive. And this may have been quite a bit counterintuitive because we still get questions this today. We actually have people, I, I kid you not, who um, will use our, our website, grok.com with a Q, and they'll use the models and it'll be fast. And they're like, this can't possibly work. And I'm like, but, but you just used it. And you used it on a big model and it worked, right? So wh where is this sort of intuition leading people in the wrong way? Well, the assumption is if you run on a smaller number of chips, that's better. And the question is why? I mean, no one's going, like in, NVIDIA is trying to go to a larger number of chips. Their latest thing is 576 chips, right? And they keep trying to go larger and larger. 
which is interesting because we, we currently run, uh, well, we were running on 576. We're now at 792. So we're already ahead of where Blackwell is going to be. Now, why is this advantageous? Why would we design for more chips rather than fewer chips? It's not about the number of chips. It's about the efficiency and being able to avoid memory. So think about it this way. If you're building a car and someone says, we're going to build a car in a factory, your first thought isn't that's going to make the car more expensive. Yes, it's going to cost a lot of money for the factory, but each car that comes out is going to be less expensive. Why? Because instead of doing it in your backyard and figuring it all out, there's just like an assembly line, right? The problem with an assembly line is you need a lot of space. And in particular, uh, if you were to think of it as you need about a million square feet, well, if you only have 100,000 square feet of assembly line space, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to set up the first one-tenth of the assembly line, run a bunch of cars through, park them in a parking lot, tear it down, set up the next one-tenth, run them through again. You're just going to have to keep doing that over and over again. That's why GPUs are so slow at producing the tokens. They're reading that config or the memory the parameters from um, external memory and it's like sipping through a martini straw whereas we just have a large system and everything just shoots through now why we're so inexpensive when we do that is because you're only on those uh, a seg segment of chips for a very short period of time just like you're only on a portion of the assembly line for a very small portion of the time but we get better use of the chips but if you're a company and you're thinking about acquiring Grok chips it, it is a massive investment how like when would a company just use your cloud provider, like your inference provider versus going and, and actually acquiring their own chips? How should they think about it? Do they need like a certain level of technical ability to, to set it up, to maintain it? I'm sure you give help, but how, how should co companies think about going cloud versus acquiring their own uh, hardware? First of all, everyone should start with Grok Cloud. Uh, you just go to console.grokwithq.com and uh, you can immediately start using us. We've, we've actually launched that about four weeks ago and we now have 70,000 developers and I think something like 17, 18,000 API keys have already been generated. So that's how many apps. And it's really easy to use. It doesn't cost you anything to get started. You just use our API like you would OpenAI. We're compatible with that. And most of the applications that have been built with us have been built that way. If you get to a point where you do that and you're like, wow, this is amazing. And I have an enormous amount of scale, right? I'm doing millions of tokens per second, then we can talk about deploying hardware for you on-prem. But right now we just handle it for you. You don't have to worry about it. And so it's sort of like, I want my specialized car to come out of the, the you know assembly line. You don't need to buy the assembly line. You just use our API and we'll get you your car super fast. You know, I've seen a lot of companies pop up where they're buying a bunch of NVIDIA cards and essentially kind of leasing them out. Is that a potential business model for Grok hardware as well? We're not going to be renting individual chips. Uh, what we will do is at some point, we will allow people to upload their own models and we will handle running that ourselves. And one of the reasons is because of the way that our hardware works, because of how automated everything is, you don't have to manually manage all of the hardware like you do with GPUs. And so it's easy for us to sort of time division multiplex or get better use of the hardware. An astounding fact is roughly 25% um, of GPUs are utilized. It's actually, I've heard that it's actually lower than that, but that's where people wow. are trying to get to. So 75% of GPU time is just wasted. Think about how much power, think about how much, these are incredibly expensive. Yeah, it's kind of like automobiles, right? They, they sit yes. unused 90% of the time. And I think like Elon Musk talks about uh, autonomous driving, how that'll vastly increase the utility of each vehicle. How do you think about getting more utility out of each card then? So you've absolutely nailed it. If anything, you should think of Grok as the Lyft or Uber of, um, mm. of generative AI, where you just make a request and we satisfy it. And we get really good utilization of that hardware. But our hardware also is less expensive. It uses about one-tenth of the power, so it's better for... Um, uh, the ecosystem and all that. And so it's just advantages all around. But the one disadvantage is you've got to start with a big chunk, just like you start with a big factory. And we just handle that for you. You just use us as a service. Okay. You, you touched on energy briefly. I want to continue on that. Let's, let's think about the future a little bit. What does the industry look like in, in five and or 10 years? And I, I've been reading a lot about Sam Altman saying compute is the currency of the future. What are the biggest bottlenecks that you see in five and 10 years? Is it electricity? Is it 
silicon? What is it? And and um, yeah, how how do you see the future as as kind of the, the leading mind and a leader of of a silicon company? So he's absolutely right that compute is going to be the limiter. We often refer to compute as the new oil, and wow. the the reason it think think about it this way: we were in an information age where you would make copies of data with high fidelity and you distribute it. That's what the internet was. That's what mobile was. But that's also what the printing press was. They're effectively the same type of technology, just at a different scale. And even though it was the same type of technology at a different scale, even that was hard for our intuitions to adapt to. But generative AI is not an information age technology because you're not making copies of something. You're making something new in the moment. And the difference is when you're making something new and in the moment, you need compute to do that. It's not about retrieving something from a hard drive, doing a little bit of compute and sending it out. You are creating it in response to a particular question. And what we often see is people will train a model and then they'll go, mission accomplished, we've succeeded. Now we're gonna put it into production. And then all of a sudden they realize they're gonna to have to spend 10 to 20 X to deploy it. And so you spend your money when you're training the models, you make your money when you're actually doing inference. So, so okay, um, I, I, I wanna continue on this topic for a second. If, if you were to give advice to other entrepreneurs, somebody who wants to start a, a startup in the AI space, they have basically four areas that they could potentially choose. They have the silicon, which you know that's where you're working and Grok. Um, they have the application layer, they have the infrastructure layer, and then they have the model layer. Where, where do you think the most value is going to be extracted in five, 10 years? Because it, it certainly does seem like models are becoming commoditized very quickly. Well, this, this was part of the calculus. As, as I mentioned, I actually had a record setting classification model, but I realized because everything was being given away for free on that part of the layer, it was going to be really hard to monetize and build a business it's much easier to do it at the picks and shovels level where you're selling physical atoms or building physical things. The problem is the era for that, it's kind of over. If you wanted to start building chips today, you're, you're not gonna get to the scale. I mean, there were, there were probably over 100 startups that were funded to build AI chips. And what people don't realize is they tend to build a feature rather than a product. It's like, we've got this one advantage but then you've got this entire ecosystem of software and everything else that you have to build. It, it, that's just too hard. The next place is more in the infrastructure space where you're, you're doing some of the drudgery, you know, the, the famous Bezos quote, do what um, makes your beer taste better, not other stuff. Like AWS was created um, to, to just handle a lot of that drudgery. Right. And if you focus on the drudgery, you have a little bit less competition. Uh, you know, it's not the sexiest thing in the world. And there are opportunities to build pretty big businesses there that are lasting. Again, it's not a great time to start those because even now there's a lot of companies, but, but you have a chance there, unlike with the chips where the lead times are, are really long. The ability to be successful in creating an actual generative AI model company or, or this, um, it, it's harder to make the prediction of what's gonna be successful. It's sort of like when the printing press first came around, it was much easier to predict that whoever was making paper was gonna do well, but there were some pretty uh, successful newspapers. So I think in terms of your expected value, it could be higher if you are working on uh, the actual AI itself, the models and so on, but your, your variance is also gonna be higher. Your ability to predict whether or not you're gonna be successful is higher. So. Really, just do, do the thing you know. You, you don't really get to pick um, because you, you, you know an area and just do that and it's going to be great. Have fun. So like one, one area that I'm particularly interested in that I think is going to generate a lot of value in the future is agents. I'm extremely bullish on agents and I, I want to get your thoughts. But my, my question to you is Grok's inference speed. In, in my mind, the pinnacle of the use case for that inference speed is agents, powering agents to work together because those agents, I know a lot of people think like humans can only read at, you know, whatever X tokens per second, certainly much lower than six, 700 tokens per second. What are your thoughts on agents? What are your thoughts on the best use cases, the, the, the unlocks that Grok's inference speeds allow for? So first of all, when we were trying to aim for 100 tokens a second, most people internally were saying, why would anyone ever need that? That's faster than I can read. Right. And what I want you to do is I want you to, if you're old enough to do this, I want you to recall back to the sound of a dial-up modem because even dial-up was faster than you could read. 
But gosh, were you excited when you got broadband? Why? Because human beings don't like to read like this as something is being printed out like an old teletype machine. Eyes scan a page really quickly and figure out almost instantly whether or not they've got what they want. What we're seeing as people use our, our chat site is that um, people will type a question and before they could ever possibly read it, they ask a follow on because they can tell it wasn't exactly what they wanted or it was, but they wanted to sort of zoom in on a particular part of it. Like, you know, when there's a bunch of bullet points, it's like, oh, tell me more about number four. And then they just keep going. Coding, it's the same thing. Right. You can tell that there's an issue. And so that speed is really important. And if you think about it, Google, after they originally did PageRank, spent almost all their time trying to improve the latency. And they discovered imperceptible changes in latency. Like literally, you would show A and B, and the human being couldn't tell you whether or not A or B was faster. When A was faster, they used it more. When B was faster, they used it more, even though they couldn't tell you which one was faster. So speed matters dramatically. Just to put a number on that, 100 milliseconds improvement in latency is an 8% conversion rate increase on uh, desktop. On mobile, it's in the 30%. So people have no so patience. What, what are your favorite use cases that that inference speed unlocks? Well, first of all, uh, um, just to give you some numbers, we, we just took normal open source models, put them on our website, and uh, we went in one week going from 8,000 new users to 400,000. We have no chat history, we have nothing, right? And then in our console, our developer console, in less than about, I think, 30 days, we got to 70,000 developers and uh, 17,000, 18,000 API keys, all with the same models everyone else has because of the speed. Why? So there are applications that you can do that you can't do elsewhere. Interactive speech, uh, but we've also seen some really wild things like infinite Wikipedia where it generates articles and if you click the link, it immediately generates the next page and you can just keep going forever. Oh, that's cool. But about every 30 minutes, someone posts a new application built on um, Grok on, on um, Twitter or something. And it's just amazing seeing all the creativity, everything from search to speech, but also these weird things like infinite Wikipedia. Okay. Um... So, so, okay, let's switch topics for a second. Let's say I am a model builder, um, whether, you know, open AI or, or, uh, Mistral or an open source company, are there particular techniques that I, I should use to optimize for Grok hardware? And then also how does a new model get chosen to be on your cloud provider? Well, great question. The first thing is there's an interesting paper called the hardware lottery which effectively says that whether or not you're, you're, you pick the right model depends on the hardware. And since everyone has been developing for um, GPUs and in particular NVIDIA GPUs, it's really hard to pull ahead because people optimize for that. And right. so the fact that we've been able to get a five to 10 X performance advantage over um, NVIDIA GPUs, it's a very rare thing. That's probably not gonna happen again. And now we have people coming to us asking, how do we optimize for your hardware? Well, the first thing is we have an automated compiler, so you don't have to do much work. Like it, it just works. But there are some things that you can do to optimize for us, in particular, architectures that take advantage of low latency. So for example, a lot of uh, model architectures that have been dismissed, like RNNs and LSTMs, because you need a really tight, low latency loop, actually work really well on our hardware. So you can now start to explore some of these other options, but more simply, um, you know, we have the ability to do quantized numerics, which by the way, we're still doing FP16 multiplies and getting that speed. Um, and so if you take advantage of our ability to quantize, if you take advantage of uh, some of the, the particular dimensions of the hardware, our faster interconnect than is available with GPUs, you can get some huge advantages. And we've walked through that with some potential um, model providers. And then lastly, we're focused on making the best of the best models available on Grok. Uh, we're not um, hugging face. We don't have 500,000 different models. Anything that we run is going to be one of the more interesting models. And we consider that part of our role to, to make some, to, to, to have a, an opinion on what is good. Okay. So Jonathan, for the last question, I really want to 
think about what the future looks like. There are a lot of people who are really afraid of AI, you know, whether it's going to take their job, whether it's going to become sentient and, and really have kind of a terminator outcome. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty positive about it, but I also understand the fear. I want to know, like, what are you most hopeful about? And then, of course, what are you most fearful about being on the inside of and seeing it all from the, you know, the eye of the tornado? That's a great question. I, I think the, the main thing on the hopeful side is I think it's going to bring subtlety and nuance to human discourse. Right now, most of the problems that we have as people are when we oversimplify things. But think about all the arguments you've ever had in your life. And the ones that have been resolved are typically the ones where you have an insight of, oh, that's what you mean, or, or now I get it from your point of view. And we've been fed a steady diet of TV, which is all about drama, a steady diet of social media, which is all about engagement and sort of working your primal um, emotions in a very simple yeah. way. And I think with generative AI, with that extra intelligence uh, and capability, you're going to ask questions. And rather than sort of your more basal instincts, I think it's going to provoke curiosity and it's going to uh, open up subtlety and nuance. And I, I think children growing up, sort of the gen gen, generative age children, will, will grow up with much more curiosity and, and a, a desire to view situations with more subtlety and nuance and will get along better just because they'll have that, that experience. On the fear side, I've been asked this a lot, should we be afraid? And there's a really good lesson from history here, which was centuries ago, Galileo invented the telescope and he got in a lot of trouble for that. He got in a lot of trouble because when he pointed it up at the sky, all of a sudden we realized that the universe was bigger than we thought. And it made us feel really small as people. And as we got used to this idea that the universe was big, much bigger than we were, we started to realize how beautiful it was and, and how much there is out there to explore. And I think the same is true of generative AI and large language models. The large language model is the telescope for the mind in the sense of it's shown us just how vast and how large and how capable intelligence is. And it's just getting started. And as we improve, we're going to start seeing further and further out. And my hope is that we're going to start looking at the vastness of intelligence as a beautiful thing rather than as a threat. And we're just going to have to come to terms with where we are in the universe. And you mentioned Gen Gen, right? So the new generation that is going to get a lot, if not most of their information from generative models, very similar to kind of traditional media, social media, somebody is ultimately controlling that algorithm. And, and that algorithm is going to change how people think about everything. What are your thoughts on, on the control of the actual algorithm of the weights and, and bias that the models might have in them? So Grok's mission is to preserve human agents in the age of AI. And the way to do that is to make sure that we continue to make decisions. The concern is not so much that AI is going to take over. It's that it's going to be convenient to give all of our decisions over. <clears throat> it starts off with, uh, I want some milk. The AI goes and orders some milk and it shows up at your home. To, I'm thirsty and it says, well, you should drink some milk. To, uh, milk's kind of expensive. Okay, vote for this politician because they're going to reduce the cost of milk, right? You just give up more and more control over time. Because we're going to be very selective about the models that we run, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the models are the ones that don't make decisions for you, but help you map out and understand and make your own decisions. And it's going to be a constant challenge. We're going to constantly learn how we do that. But rather than making the decisions, it's about um, opening up the aperture for people to see what is in front of them so they can make their own decisions. Yeah, that, that's certainly going to be a challenge. Um you know, curating models, curating information, essentially, but a big and important challenge nonetheless. So Jonathan, thank you so, so much for joining me today. Thank you for your amazing insights. Really appreciate your time. And uh, thanks again, Jonathan, CEO of Grok. Um, thanks for having me. And uh, it's great to be here. Thanks.